All right, what is MQTT part two? Take zero. A huge thank you to EMQX, the enterprise broker, for sponsoring this video. All right, so this is the second video on MQTT. What is MQTT, right? We're revisiting after a couple of years, primarily because we want to go over Spark Plug B and MQTT 5, okay? If you haven't watched the first video on what is MQTT, or you haven't watched the videos before that, which is what is OPC and OPC UA, go back and watch those videos, okay? In this video, we're gonna go over key elements of MQTT, some things that you need, if you're gonna, if you wanna know about MQTT, there are some key elements you need to know about, and then I'm gonna sketch like what the MQTT stack looks like, okay? All right, so key element number one, about MQTT is, I really should have put a previous one, which is where did it come from? In the last video I talked about that, it was invented by Arlen Nipper and Andy Stanford Clark from IBM and Arlen, I can't remember what company he was with, but they were, they were developing a new industrial protocol for Philips 66 in the late 90s. It ended up getting adopted in consumer technology. So Philips 66 uh, widely adopted it, completely transformed their business because um, it's lightweight, edge-driven, report by exception. It basically were able to retrieve massive amounts of data, all of their uh, telemetry data over um, very slow and unreliable serial networks, okay? That's where MQTT came from. That's its origination, okay? Late 90s. During the early 2000s and into like 2010, 11, and 12, MQTT really spread out through like the hobbyist community. It was adopted by Facebook. If you look at um, Facebook Messenger, anywhere where you see the ellipses being used, where if somebody else is typing and you're seeing the little dots, that's MQTT. Under the hood, it's because MQTT clients that connect into brokers, those are stateful connections. And so when I'm typing and, and I'm messaging Zach, uh, Zach's messenger client is subscribing to a topic from our connection, which is whether I'm typing. If I am typing, they're getting notified from the broker that I am typing and their application on the other end is creating those ellipses, okay? Zach doesn't have to check he doesn't have to keep checking to the broker to see if I'm typing. The broker is notifying him that I'm typing and I am notifying the broker that I'm typing while I'm typing my, my keyboard, okay? So MQTT is everywhere around you. Uh, Google Nest uses MQTT in many places. It's under the hood. Um, a very, very common place that MQTT is used in the automotive industry is cars notify, cars will connect to the internet and publish payload data to central brokers over MQTT. Very, very common, okay? MQTT didn't start getting widely adopted in industrial applications until like 2010 to 2013 in that area. Over the last eight years, it's absolutely exploded and MQTT is the industrial IoT protocol on the planet. It's the number one most popular IIoT protocol on the planet, okay? So you need to know the inventors, Arlen Nipper and Andy Stanford Clark and where it came from. Number two, Oasis Open. Uh, you need to know Oasis because that's where the MQTT standards, that's where they're written, that's where they're approved and that's where they're maintained. So if you wanna read, there are basically two MQTT standards. You have MQTT 3.1.1 which was approved by OASIS in 2014 and has been administered by 2014. If somebody says MQTT to you, they're almost certainly talking about MQTT 3, 3.1.1, that version, okay? In 2019, OASIS approved the MQTT 5 standard, which it's backwards compatible to MQTT 3.1.1, but it's added in a bunch of additional features, okay? All right. For the 3.1.1 standard, so I strongly encourage that you go to OASIS open and you read the 311 standard and the MQTT 5 standard. So you need to know Oasis open, the people who, man who manage the standards, Oasis. You need to know the 311 standard. You don't need to know the standard, the products all work easily. But if you wanna know what works under the hood, go look at 311 and MQTT 5. The Eclipse Foundation, okay, is the body that manages the spark plug specifications. So these are in order. Okay. The Sparkplug Working Group at the Eclipse Foundation is made up of companies like Flow Software, Canary Labs, uh, Cirrus Link, you know, all the companies that, many of the companies that make Sparkplug B tools, that working group is the one who drives the Sparkplug standard. So I'm going to explain Sparkplug here in a second, okay? 
So the Eclipse Foundation manages the spark plug standard, which is the, the MQTT standard for industry. So when I'm doing an MQTT solution, right, I wanna, I wanna use MQTT to connect all the nodes in my business together so that I can share data and information openly between all the nodes in my business. What's a node? A node could be a PLC, it could be an MES system, it could be your ERP system, it could be your CMMS, it could be anything else. It could be a piece of test lab equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It could be people. What you wanna do is connect those all together in this hub and spoke architecture with a unified namespace in the middle. That unified namespace is generally a broker. Most times it's MQTT broker where the data, the topic namespace is organized like your business. Imagine it like a file share. I wanna be able to go to a file share and navigate to Philips 66, you know, site one, device A, and I wanna look at all the tags in there. And then I wanna go back up to site one and look at the topic called operational efficiency or total production. Imagine having the ability to do that. You do that with MQTT. The infrastructures that we create, we do that using MQTT. We don't do that using OPC UA, okay? All right, so in an earlier video, we kind of showed you one of the reasons that OPC UA is not an IoT protocol, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that the standard tries to be everything to everyone, and therefore it's nothing to everybody. So go back and watch that video, and Jeff Schrader did a great example of all the options in the standard that basically no one ever puts in. MQTT is pretty simple, all right? On the bottom, you have MQTT3, <laughs> and you have MQTT5, okay? Those are the core standards, okay? There's, there's only a couple of optional elements in either of those standards. And they are backwards compatible. So I can, it, you know, MQTT5 builds on MQTT3, okay? So when we look, MQTT5 clients should be able to talk to MQTT3 infrastructures, okay? MQTT5 has a couple of major additions. So from, you know, 2014, MQTT3 was adopted. 2019, MQTT5 was adopted. Here are some examples of changes that they made in the MQTT5 standard. They added in the ability to both the client and the broker to disconnect a TCP connection. It used to be just the client could do that. Now they're allowing the broker to disconnect the connection to the client and notify to the client that they're gonna disconnect it. Okay, they added in authorization codes, they added in reason codes in the headers, they've added in um, the, basically the ability to send metadata in a publish a transaction or a subscription. You could add in metadata to provide some additional context without having used the topic payload to create the context. They added in some things like that, okay? But the vast majority of the stuff you see in the, in the world right now is MQTT3 solutions, okay? So you've got MQTT3, you got MQTT5, and then on top of that, you basically have, we'll just do spark plug B. There's a couple of, you can, you could do raw flat MQTT, we call it flat, where I'm just using the MQTT3 standard for my clients to talk to my broker and vice versa. I could use just the MQTT5 standard, okay? Or I could put the spark plug B standard on top of MQTT three or five, okay? Sparkplug B adds in, the, the two major things that Sparkplug B adds in is like industrial hierarchy and compression, okay? The Sparkplug B standard is managed by the Eclipse Foundation. That's where the user group is, the Sparkplug B user group. Arlen Nipper, the inventor of MQTT, his company is one of the companies that's part of the Eclipse, or uh, the Sparkplug B. Sparkplug B was basically added in to tell because MQTT is used in both consumer and industrial applications, Sparkplug B was the standard written by Arlen Nipper and his team to tell industrial users, hey, here's how we recommend you use MQTT to transmit industrial data. That's what the Sparkplug B spec is. It's about 70 pages long. It's very, very easy to implement. We, in fact, we at 4.0 Solutions wrote our own MQTT spark plug B transmitter using PAHO Python libraries. It was very easy to implement, took less than a day, okay? This is why you see such wide adoption of MQTT across the market because it's so easy to implement, okay? That's the number one reason. So by the way, this is the MQTT stack here. You got the MQTT3 standard, 
you've got the MQTT5 standard, and then you really have Spark Plug B. Now, there is a Spark Plug A, which was the first version of the standard. Here are some things that Spark Plug also added in a UDT support, they call it template. So basically what Spark Plug B does is it tells you how you can use MQTT to send UDT definition in your payload. So I can, instead of just sending flat tags, right? P66, you know, site, site one, temp, instead of just P66 forward slash site one temp, I can also send a temperature definition in there. So say this temperature is a user defined data type that has a bunch of attributes underneath it. And it's basic, think of it as a class in regular software development. Spark plug B gives me the ability to send the definition, okay? Why do I bring that up? I normally wouldn't talk about this kind of thing in a video for lay people. Here's why. When we talk about companion specifications in OPC UA, companion specifications are generally, they call them information models. They really should be data models. They should call them data models. The companion specs are generally a separate specification to tell you how to tell you what a separate specification that tells you how to construct and send basically a user defined data type using OPC UA. With MQTT, the way they do it, is they use a common standard. Instead of having 100 companion specifications, one for each UDT that you wanna send, they have a mechanism in Spark Plug B to tell you how to flag something as a user-defined data type to say, this is a template. It's a model that I am publishing to the broker. The broker will consume that and say, and know, hey, that's a model, it's a template and it can notify other clients, Spark Plug B clients, that hey, this is a template, it's a user-defined data type, and therefore you should treat it as such, okay? With OPC UA, you have to implement the companion spec on one side for that specific information model, CNC for example, and then I've gotta be using a client that can consume the CNC information model by implementing that specific companion specification. So one of the big advantages of MQTT over OPC UA is that in general, OPC UA uses companion specifications to tell you how to create a user-defined data type for a specific process and how to consume it. In MQTT, we use Spark Plug B to just flag that, okay? All right, so that's basically your MQTT stack. That's as easy as it gets, okay? And here's the other beauty. Let's say that I've got an MQTT broker out here, okay? I've got a broker. Actually, let me do it differently. I have an MQTT broker here, okay? And I have a MQTT3, and an MQTT5, and a Spark Plug B client, okay? This client right here is the only one that can decipher a Spark Plug B payload, okay? This is the only one that can support the deciphering of reason codes, reason codes and authorization, authorization topics that are included in MQTT5. And this one, and this one only talks flat vanilla MQTT3, this client. The beauty of MQTT is that my broker can support all three. All MQTT5 and three are, so Spark Plug B is, the underlying, the underlying structure of MQTT doesn't change with Spark Plug B. Here's what Spark Plug B does. Spark Plug B says this. When you connect a client to a broker, you're going to create a birth certificate and we're gonna manage death certificates. Why? It really boiled down to Spark Plug B added in the support for us to monitor the health of connections, okay? Before you had to rely on the MQTT broker, whoever implemented the broker, to include that feature. So EMQX, IMQ, whatever. Do they, are they monitoring those connections, right? The health. Spark Plug B with birth certificates and death certificates. Spark Plug B gave you the ability to monitor the health of connections based on the number of births you see. Number two, Spark Plug B gave you the ability to create industrial hierarchies using group IDs, node IDs, right? I can take namespaces from multiple devices and send them to the same group. And the group would be my plant. So let's say I had a broker at my organization and I have 12 MQTT clients inside of one facility. I can assign a group ID for that specific facility, facility A. And I can say, hey, Spark Pub B client one through 12, your group ID is 
facility A. And what I'll get is facility A with all 12 groups and all their namespaces, right? Sparkplug B also added in support for compression. It added in a bunch of other support too. But the, for us, the, big, the three big ones are sending UDTs, that is actual definitions as payloads, uh, individual hierarchy and compression, that's Sparkplug B. MQTT3 is all the native basic MQTT technology. Here's, here's what a client looks like, here's what a broker looks like, here's how you publish, here's how you subscribe, this is what quality of service is, etc. MQTT5 took some of the advantages created with Sparkplug B, written by Arlen Nipper and his team and now administered by the Eclipse Foundation, and added in some of those things natively into MQTT5, plus some other stuff, okay? But the beauty of the way that this is managed is that the focus of the people who develop MQTT has been to create an edge-driven, lightweight, report by exception, open standard from day one. And we're, if we contrast that with the OPC Foundation, right, what is their goal? Their goal is, you know, tongue in cheek, but what's the ultimate goal? It's not really open. The ultimate goal is interoperability between their members' applications, right? Or more importantly, interoperability between a member's applications at the OPC Foundation. So if you wanna know why we're so high on MQTT, part of it's philosophy, right? Philosophy of the people who A, invented the technology. Arlen Nipper gave, Arlen and Andy, gave MQTT to Oasis to administer, and Arlen's team gave Sparkplug B to the Eclipse Foundation to manage, okay? Arlen doesn't own Sparkplug B, and he doesn't own MQTT. He doesn't have a patent on MQTT. He doesn't get paid for every implementation of it. He's literally turned it over to the community, okay? And then what does Cirrus Link do? They build solutions that support his open community democratic protocol and standard, okay? Let's talk from a practical sense. So we, why are we so high on it philosophically? Let's talk about it practically, okay? Because it's edge driven, because it's edge driven, I can scale my applications better because it's more lightweight. I can scale my applications better because I don't have to deterministically take someone centrally and go, oh, I added a machine. I need to, that machine's on the plant floor now. I need to add it here into my infrastructure. What I can do is tell all my she machines to notify me that they've been added. So as I add new equipment, they show up in the infrastructure. You can't do that with OPC UA. Well, you probably could using auto discovery if anyone ever built it, okay? The fact that they haven't built it should tell you everything about it, <laughs> okay? That's number one. Number two, it's report by exception. So the things that we're publishing are only things that have ever changed. We don't waste overhead on stuff that hasn't changed. Number three, it's completely open architecture, okay? I can build my own MQTT client. Here, this is a really good example. I want you to Google MQTT broker, MQTT client, and find out just how many free MQTT tools there are out there. And then I want you to do the exact same thing for OPC. I want you to, to try and see how many free OPC clients there are, how many free OPC servers are there are out there, and then compare to how many there are with MQTT, okay? The reason that matters is this. It goes to philosophy and it goes to architecture. The philosophy of the people who build MQTT is open, MQTT tools, okay? And number two, because the specs are, in my opinion, they have no technical debt, okay? Because they're so new, right? The first MQTT spec that's been used in industry was developed in 2014, unlike with OPC Classic, which was developed in the mid 90s. Okay, look how much technology has changed since the mid 90s. Because of that, it's easy to develop very inexpensive tools that you can just give away to people for free. Okay, all right. So anyway, what is MQTT key elements? The key elements are, remember the inventors, Oasis Open, who manages the core specs, the Eclipse Foundation, who manages Sparkplug B. That's also where the Sparkplug working group is, headed up by Arlen Nipper and his team at Sirislink. 3.1.1 was the original MQTT standard that everyone started using in industry in 2014. Sparkplug A and B were the industrial standards. How do you take MQTT? Three, the base three, and be able to ship UDTs, uh, create industrial hierarchies, and add compression, plus a bunch of other things to Sparkplug B. I encourage you to read this spec. It's only about 70 pages long. It, a big light bulb will come on when you read it. And then MQTT5, which is the latest standard adopted in 2019 that added a bunch of new features. By the way, I wanna say this. 
if you look at how MQTT standards are, are, are changing, are evolving from MQTT3 to MQTT5, there is one thing that stands out above all else. Focus on industry. And that's all you need to know. What you really need to know is that if you watch how the standards are evolving, they're all fully backwards compatible, but if you look at how they're evolving, they're evolving for industry. And that's all you should need to know about which, which is being more widely adopted, MQTT or OPC. Nice. This video is sponsored by EMQX, the enterprise class clustered MQTT broker for your enterprise class IoT solutions. If you want to know more, go to emqx.io. Why do we love EMQX? Okay, and this is a sponsored message. Okay, EMQX is a an exceptional best-in-class enterprise broker, primarily because of their clustering technology. So there's basically two things that really, well, three things. Number one, EMQX is really easy to work with. Okay, so it, uh, learning curve is very short. If you're familiar with MQTT, okay, we're in this video, what is MQTT? If you're familiar with MQTT and you understand how the protocol and the standard work, then working with the MQX is gonna be really easy. Very, very short learning curve. Number two, if you wanna build really huge enterprise class scalable projects, they have a beautiful clustering technology for their brokers. That means that as messages increase and topics increase and the number of clients connected to the broker increase, you can add additional brokers to that cluster. Think of it as, for those of you who are SQL nerds, understanding how SQL clusters work with virtual host names. So I can have a massive cluster of SQL databases in the background, the actual instances themselves, with one virtual host name that allows me to talk to a, a virtual host name that connects me to that whole cluster. And I may not know which broker I'm talking to. EMQX has very similar technology, clustering technology. So that's number two. Number three, throughput. In our benchmarks, EMQX, we've compared EMQX to basically every broker out in the market, it doesn't matter what you look at. If you look at Cirrus Links, Chariot, SCADA, Ignition's distributor, if you look at HiveMQ, if you look at Mosquito, it does, you name it, EMQX is the most performant in all of our benchmarks. That is throughput, connections, memory consumption, you name it, it's the most performant. And, and as part of EMQX's sponsorship for us, we're gonna be doing some of those tests. So thank you to EMQX for sponsoring this series. Let's go ahead and move on to what is MQTT. All right, 